Hello. My name's Dr. John Allman. I'm a full-time GP based in Dublin, Ireland. Um, I want to thank Shireen and Tom for having invited me over. And I'm really impressed at the turnout and the fact that you've lasted this long, actually, right to the very end. But I'm, what I'm going to talk about, can I just check how many of your GPs? Okay, because I heard the question earlier, how are we supposed to do this? How are we supposed to try and change someone's diet in 10 to 15 minutes? I'd advocate we can. Okay, it is hard, but this is what I do, and this is what I wanted to talk about. So, just briefly, to run through the objectives of what I'm going to chat through is a little bit of my journey. Summarizing the evidence of benefit, which is what we've done all day. Uh, but I'm not going to give you highbrow academic stuff. This is more just chatting from personal experience. I'm going to discuss a little bit of behavior change. What's the theory behind it? Case studies from my practice just in the last few months. And what is, are some of the barriers to change that we find? This is Trinity College Dublin, where I started medical school in the late 80s. And I know you're thinking, wow, how could you start on the late 80s? <laughs> I, I only look 21. But Andy showed us a picture earlier where he managed to convert himself into a, sort of morphed into a, a version of his son almost. <laughs> so one of the side effects of a plant-based diet is you're, you, you're nearly reverse aging. But the reason to put this up was I was actually going to say the standard thing, but Alan's now changed that. Because I was going to say we don't get much nutrition training in medical school. But it's true what he says, we do get nutrition training. We learn it, we learn all about the micronutrient level and the Krebs cycle and how glucose is metabolized. But what we don't learn is the power of nutrition. We don't see that it is relevant. We don't learn how to do behavior change. It's all just lip service. So my journey, if I think back, I was trying to think where this started. And I was thinking 15 years ago, I came across a book which a flatmate was reading, which is Fast Food Nation. And when I was reading through it, I thought, the power of food, such as fast food, to cause ill health, the effect on the welfare of the people who work in the industry, on the animals, and even the chemical industry, whereby, whereby we can create bacon cheeseburger flavors in a test tube. And I thought, I know nothing about food. So I went to the local library in Dublin. I took two books off the shelf, and they happened to be Food Politics, by Marion Nessel was the first one. And she's a professor of nutrition who was the editor of the first Surgeon General Guidelines on Nutrition in 1988. Went on to be involved in the production of the first food pyramid in 1992. And what the book is about is the difficulty she had presenting the evidence with the political interference and the vested interest, uh, interests of the food industry. And that shocked me, that we can have evidence, we know what's right, but you're not allowed to say it. So the second book I picked off, incidentally, was John Robbins' Food Revolution. And looking through this, I came across Dean Ornish's work for the first time. And I was amazed that, I don't know, 10 years qualified, and I, I realized, wow, we can reverse diet. There is a diet that reverses heart disease. How come I never knew about that? So I took the information, I became a GP in Brighton, and I sort of put it in my back pocket. So now and then you'd get a patient who'd come in, end of the road in terms of heart disease, there's not many options, and I'd say, do you know, there is an option. But I was nearly scared sharing the information. I was nearly nervous saying, you might have to stop eating meat or stop eating dairy. Then when I came back to Dublin, I actually ended up working with the GP who treated me as a kid in my local practice which was a, quite a funny t turn of events. But he had read the China study, and he became a big advocate for the China study for cancer patients. So when patients would come in, he would just say to them, go read the China study. And it amazes me still that so many people change their diet in my local practice. And it's probably because of the charisma and the long-term relationship that a GP has with their patients. That you can think at a public health level, you can say, eat more veg. But we forget as a GP that we have such a power with our individual patients. And they respect us and presume that what we're going to say is in their interest. So what he gave me, Dr. Kelly, he gave me two things. I suppose one thing he gave me was 
the confidence to share this information with patients because he was already doing it. And the second thing was, he wrote a book, Stop Feeding Your Cancer. And this was probably his cherry-picked cases that he'd found over probably nine, ten years of doing this. Uh, and then he retired. So he left me to carry the mantle. So, if we look, what we've talked about today, and I'm just going to summarise it very briefly, is we've all talked about this is a good way to eat. Okay, so we know Dean Ornish, Caldwell Esselstein, Tom's presented it very well. We know that we can prevent, treat, and reverse heart disease. We know we can treat, we can reverse, potentially reverse diabetes. We know that we can reverse early stage prostate cancer from Ornish's trials. We've got evidence for autoimmune disease, kidney disease, and Andy presented a list there of about 20 conditions. It shocks me that I learned that this was heart disease, and then it became heart disease plus diabetes, and then it's just becoming longer and longer. Obesity, we've got a trial, the broad study from last year, showing that we can reverse, we can bring people, make them lose weight and bring down their cholesterol, with, and maintain it for a year without any calorie restriction, so they can eat as much as they like and still lose weight. We can improve gut health in the microbiome, and people talk about increased vitality, increased energy. Athletes are starting to do this to improve their athletic performance. So this is phenomenally good, but we're all saying the same thing. Why aren't we doing it? And when I think about this, I sort of thought about the definition of health. And if we think about the definition of health, the WHO says health is a state of complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. And it makes me realize that we've probably got a healthcare system that despite saying this in 1948, we still have a disease care system. So what we do is we are trained as doctors to diagnose and manage through medications and procedures the disease when it's developed. We're not trained in, in how to tackle the behaviors that would lead to a more broader aspect of health. So if we look at some of the theory behind behavior change, most doctors will be aware of this. This is probably one of the theories that's most widely accepted in healthcare, which is the cycle of change by Prochaska and de Clemente from the 80s. Originally set up for the management of sort of trying to help people come off alcohol. And there's five stages. And it depends on your readiness for, stay, for, for change, which level you're in. And it's a, it's a circle, but it's probably better to see it as a spiral because you often can slip back and slip back. Studies have shown that people giving up smoking would often get, do three tries before they give up. And if we see that in a more linear format, we see that the pre-contemplation is the person who has no idea that they need to change. The contemplation is saying maybe, and technically they say that's maybe in the next six months. Preparation is like, okay, I'm going to do it. In the next month, I'm going to start this behavior change. And then action is the doing Hopefully they'll get maintenance, and maintenance is usually when you've maintained it for six months. But at any stage you could relapse, and you can relapse back to any stage. So if I take that to my practice, and where do these stages of change come into what I do? If I take someone at the stage of action, that's usually a person who's heard that I'm interested in this, so they come in and they say that they're vegan or a whole food plant-based diet. And it's a very easy consultation. We love talking about this. So they, they'll say things like, uh, I think I'm nutritionally deficient, or could you just check out certain parameters? Very easy consultation. Doable in 10, 15 minutes easily. The second are probably the patients who've come along because of Dr. Kelly's book. They come from all over Ireland, and probably one, two a month. And they, they tend to come in, and they're a very easy group because they've gone from contemplation to preparation. They've read the book and they've said, okay, I need to change my diet. They may have changed their diet. So all I'm doing is saying, this is the evidence. It's excellent. Let's see if you can do it. I, I take about 30 minutes. My staff say I take about an hour because I get carried away. <laughs> but it's a very enjoyable consultation. The other three are probably the pre-contemplation groups that I'd see. Okay, So somebody comes in. The first one I'd say is the one who I feel obliged to share this information. So this is someone with serious illness. This is someone with diabetes, heart disease. I can think of a patient who came in Last October, he had a heart attack. He had stents. Three months later, he goes in again with a heart attack. He's on maximal therapy. And he's scared. He's feeling vulnerable. He's not sure what to do next. So I feel obliged to share this information. I've only got 10, 15 minutes. 
So what I tend to do is just do something really quick. So I'll say, there is lots of evidence to say that we can reverse this through your diet. I'll say, watch forks over knives. I have copies of forks over knives, I might loan out to them. I might give them a copy of how not to die. But I do something quick, but I say it. I don't wait. The second group are the risk factors. So these are the people who've got high blood pressure, high blood sugar, maybe hypertension. And I can use those conditions to say there's things we can do that can improve that through your diet. And patients love to hear stuff about their diet. They really are enthusiastic if we remember to say it. The third group, a little harder. They have no problems. So you can ask why are they coming to see me. But this is sort of the... <laughs> This is the well man review or the well woman review. It's often like I've had my 45th birthday and I thought I should have a check. <laughs> uh, they'll often present things. They'll say, I know somebody who had heart disease incidentally found. So then you've got a route, a way in. I am worried about prostate cancer. I'm worried about colon cancer. We've got loads of ways in if they bring that up. If they don't, you develop techniques over time. So I'll often start with something like the Eat Well Guide. In the UK, the most recent one, has says, for protein, you should take two to three portions of pulses. So I share that with them. Do you take many pulses? They rarely do. And then I say, and we know that pulses, as was mentioned earlier, I think Hannah said 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease, and Shireen was saying 30% reduction in cardiovascular disease. So I share that with them. Uh, I'll say that we have evidence to say that studies have shown that if you take a handful of pulses in your diet every day for eight weeks and change nothing else, you lose weight. So little tips like that to, to make it relevant, to sell it to them. If we look at how do we push someone from one stage to the next, okay? So what, what we, William Miller over here on the left is a psychologist who seems to be the father of brief interventions or, or motivational interviewing. And in terms of brief interventions, this is something we should be doing all the time, and it's really basically ask and advise. It's doctor-centered, but it's bringing up the topic and saying, would you change it? Uh, it's a bit, it's not very structured, a bit vague, but it does work. We've all had the patient who comes in and says, doctor, I've stopped smoking because of what you said last time. And we say, what did I say last time? I have no idea. <laughs> but we forget the power of what we say. The motivational interviewing takes a little bit more time. It tends to be engaging with the patient, understanding their resistance to change, and using little techniques to push them from their level of resistance to what would help them change. But you're making it come from the patient rather than from the doctor. If you've got the time, cognitive behavioral therapy, health coaching, all that, all that would be useful, but d difficult for us as doctors. The WHO has come up with the five A's model. So this is to remind us what do we say? More like a brief intervention. So they'll say, ask. Ask, maybe ask permission to discuss the behavior. Ask about the diet. So what I'll say very quickly, and this is your 10 minute consultation, what you have for breakfast. And I know straight away, if they say a fry, cocoa pops, relative to an overnight bircher with cinnamon and nuts and berries, I have a fair idea where they're coming from. I can move on to lunch and say, what you have for lunch yesterday? And if they say a bacon buddy or a, do you know what I mean, a chicken roll, I can say, oh, have you thought about adding lettuce in there or tomatoes? Or So I'm just pushing the simple, it's like the low-hanging fruit in a way. Advice is just pushing the, pushing the addition of something, like the pulses, the greens. Assess the willingness to change. There's nothing like going to see a doctor and they hold forth for 10 minutes on their hobby horse, okay? So you really have to say, are they willing? Are they listening? And not just, not just push it. Uh, assisting. So the assisting is probably what you do. You want your resources. So I'll have a page that I'll hand out and I might have websites. I'll have books. Uh, and it's really just a list of things really to motivate them further. And then arrange a formal follow-up. I want a formal follow-up, maybe three weeks, maybe six weeks. And I want to get parameters to show them how they're doing. I want a blood pressure, I want a, a BMI, I want a cholesterol level. So I can feed back going, you're doing great, keep it up, and try and raise the game. The five O's model is also part of this WHO toolkit, which is dealing with the people who don't want to change. 
Okay, this is the resistance. So, is it relevant to them? And this is what we've mentioned. You have to make it relevant. You have to link it. This way you can't generalize to everybody saying this is what everybody has to do. You have to make it personal to them. And you have to run through the risks. Okay, so you'll have the overweight person who's got a high blood pressure and maybe impaired fasting glucose and you'll say, you're probably going to be diabetic in the next five years. You're going to triple the chance of a heart attack. So you really have to push the risks if they're not listening. The rewards, I'll often say, maybe I'll share my own personal experience. But I'll easily share my patient's experience. That I've had a patient who's lost weight or a patient who's reversed their heart disease. The roadblocks, these are the barriers, the specific barriers. We'll run through them in a second, but just to try and address them so they're prepared for these challenges. And then repetition. You need to bring this up again and again. But not ad nauseum and not forcing it down their throat so you get a reaction. I rarely use an action plan because I rarely get someone who comes into me and says, tell me how to go plant-based. What I find is I will tell a patient and I'll sort of plant the seed and sometimes it blossoms and they come back to me knowing more than I know. But if they ask for an action plan, I'll usually say, okay, start with your favorite foods. What do you like? Let's veganize them or plant-based them. Let's see if you can get your your be your mint burrito and turn it into a bean burrito. Let's get your chicken burger and turn it into a veggie burger, even if it's transitional foods. I'll get them to remove processed animal foods from the kitchen, get a new shopping list, all their plant-based stuff, setting a start date so they're psychologically motivated with them starting on such a date. Get into the recipe books, learning how to cook again. Get them the 21-day eating plan. They say it takes 21, 22 days, 21 days to create a habit. So try and get them into a certain period of time. I'll, I'll try and address the things that people fall down on. What are your snacks? What are your treats? What, do, what are you going to do at work? What are you going to do when you eat out? Just so they're mentally prepared for those times where we often fall. Just to run through then, we've got a few case studies. So the first one, a patient, 44-year-old, he's had low back pain for years. He's had swollen joints in his hands, swollen joints in his, in his feet. Comes to see me, I send him to a rheumatologist, probably this time last year. Uh, diagnosed with an inflammatory arthritis, a psoriatic arthritis, a bit like Leida's story. Uh, and he goes on methotrexate, so a high-powered immunosuppressive drug, takes it for three months, no effect. He's put on silazopyrene, again, three months, no effect. So he goes to see the rheumatologist last October who says, it's not working, you're developing deformities, this is serious. We're going to have to put you on to new biological therapy, but we're going to have to work you off. We're going to have to put you on a chest, we're going to have to get your chest x-ray, do some bloods, you're going to have to read through the side effects. And now he's scared. So he comes to see me, this is a 10 minute consultation, and he says, what do I think? And I'm not sure what I think about biological therapies, but I thought he needed help. So I say, I know that there's elements in our diet that's inflammatory and there's elements of other diets that are anti-inflammatory so I can run you through experiences of maybe changing a few things he seems willing I tell him the example of Brooke Goldner who's a doctor from Texas who appeared in Eating You Alive who reversed her own lupus I say she used green smoothies okay so maybe if you decrease the inflammatory products which are often meat and dairy and encourage a high antioxidant diet with plants and color and variety. I give him a, a smoothie recipe and then I just give him a load of resources. Nutrition, nutritionfacts.org that we've talked about for the evidence from Dr. Greger. The PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine with the 21 day kickstart. I give him Plantrition Project for all sorts of resources. And even Ornish Spectrum has, has a lot of his evidence and, and recipes as well. So he comes back to me. About two months later, he's feeling much better. His joint pain's gone away, except for one joint. He's off his anti-inflammatories. He hadn't stopped for a year. Uh, he's sleeping better. I got a letter from the rheumatologist two weeks ago to say that this guy is following a strict vegan diet, but it's highly anti-inflammatory. And we're not going to put him on anything for the moment. We'll review him in three months. But the interesting thing with this case for me is He's researched loads, he's learnt loads, he has changed his diet, but he's flexible with it. He drops it for Christmas. 
his pain's come back. And he's done his own little personal experiment on himself. The rest of his family eat as before. So no change. Which is probably difficult for him. Because he's going to have to make two meals. So his ability to maintain this is going to be much harder. It's as if he uses this as a medication that he can drop and take as he goes on. But it's very rewarding for me as a doctor to get somebody who comes back and all I did was a little suggestion and he feels like he's in control of his disease. Second case was a patient who came in to me about a month ago. A black African with hypertension. Put on one antihypertensive about five years ago, then a second antihypertensive. And he comes in to me in February and says, I want to stop all my medications. I'm sick of taking medications. And I gave him the standard response, which we do for chronic disease, saying when you start a medication, you usually stay on it for life. And then a little caveat saying, unless you want to change your diet, do exercise, stress management, all the other things. And he was game. So with someone like that, I'll often, <clears throat> I might take a piece of information. So I'll say, one thing we know is that if you take, say, an Egg McMuffin or a Sausage McMuffin or a Chicken Burger, we know that the fat causes your arteries to stiffen within minutes, with a maximum stiffening, about four hours. But if you take green leafy veg because of the nitric oxide release, you loosen that. So to give him the relevant thing for him and his blood pressure, I was able to tell him that what you put in your mouth instantly affects your body. So he was game, and he came back to me just two weeks ago. And he came back early. I'd said leave it two months because I wasn't sure how long it would take him. He was dizzy with exercise. Uh, I took his blood pressure, it was low, I had to stop one of his medications. He was passionate about this. He'd become such an advocate that he was meeting friends who were diabetics and they were plant-based the next day after talking to him. <laughs> he, it was still his diet, but his kids were starting to steal little bits of his salad and he'd never seen them eating salad before. Uh, but interestingly, he said, I'm not vegan, I'm not vegetarian. I'm just plant-based. So he made a big distinction between that. This wasn't an ethical reason. But what it was, was his motivation was intrinsic. It was from within, he'd seen the benefit, and that made it much easier for him to maintain that. So if we look through the barriers, what stops us? I'm just going to give you the barriers I've come across, or what I've thought of in terms of my experience. So the first one, is ignorance, it's information. If a patient doesn't know, they can't change. If a doctor doesn't know, they can't get a patient to change. If a doctor knows, but doesn't practice it, it's very hard for them to push that on the patient. We know that doctors that are obese or doctors that smoke are much less likely to tackle these behaviours with patients. But then if a doctor knows and practices it, Sometimes you have a feeling, this is my worldview. Maybe I love running marathons. Should I push that in my patients? Or I've changed my religion and it makes me feel better. Should I push that in my patients? And probably what Dr. Kelly told me was, this is information that should be shared. But then there's another barrier, which is time. How do you do this? Resources. Can we refer people on? So it's a little bit restricted in terms of what we're able to do. But at the same time, I would argue that I would feel it's negligent for doctors to have a patient who comes in with advanced heart disease who's at the end of the road for medical treatment and is not offered the option of changing their diet. I had a patient with colon cancer who came back to me two years, discharged from the hospital two years before he'd had the colon cancer. And as he sat down with me going, I think you're meant to follow me up. I said, what you, what, what you have for breakfast? And he says, a fry. And I said, oh, sausages and rashes. I said, did you not know that in 2015 the WHO said that it causes colon cancer? And he said, no. And I said, no one ever told you. And he said, no. And that, that's smacks of negligence for me. The other thing then is, how do we, if you, if you wanted to say this to your doctor, how do you say it? Should you bring this up with your doctor? And I would say yes. I would say, if you do it respectfully, and you try and hand it over to the doctor so it's, that they, it's their decision, but if you share that I feel much better, 
My disease may have improved. I'm eating lots of fruit and vegetables and grains. And maybe sharing some evidence, maybe Esselstein's editorial, maybe Kaiser Permanente's plant-based diet for physicians, some formal evidence. Any doctor should objectively be able to look at that and say, this looks sensible. The next barrier is that of taste. The thing they're most scared of is, what am I going to do without my ice cream and my pizza and my chicken burger? And we're only born with one innate natural taste, which is that of the sweetness of breast milk. Everything else is acquired. But we have a biological mechanism whereby we release the dopamine neurotransmitter, which is the pleasure hormone, the reward hormone, the uh, neurotransmitter in the brain, and it creates a behavioral conditioning where we keep coming back for more. We keep craving fat, sugar, salt. And the food industry has realized that if you combine these in forms that we've never seen in nature, we don't find high fat in nature, high salt in nature. And if we find sugar, we find it combined with fiber, which is, which is different altogether. So we get caught into this cycle of repeated feeding, of, of feeding this craving for these items. The other thing is that we come back with the habit we eat unconsciously. Brian Wansink, clinical psychologist in the States, has worked out that we make 200 food choices a day. 90% of them are unconscious. So we enter this habit pattern of just eating. So I'll often say, you need a food diary. Because if you get a food diary, you write it down, you review it, and you say, Jesus, this is actually what I'm eating. Okay, so we need to make it conscious what people are eating. The other thing is, tastes change. They need to understand that it takes maybe three weeks to three months. But once you decrease your salt, decrease your fat, you actually appreciate less of it. And that shocked me. I can remember having a sweet tooth. And after going plant-based, I'd always loved a penguin chocolate bar. And when I took a bite of one, three months into this, I spat it out and it tasted like plastic. And that was shocking for me personally to see that my physical tastes meant something that I had such an emotional attachment with had gone. The other skill, the other barrier then is skills and time. You're going to have to learn how to cook, I would feel. You're going to have to learn new recipes. You're going to have to learn what are beans and pulses. What are whole grains? How do you cook them? So this, this is where they're going to have to learn new recipes. There's an issue with, with convenience. We're all living in a society where it's just speedy, speedy. And often when you go speedy and you're plant-based, you go sort of unhealthy vegan because they're the options. We are getting more options, but to go whole food, I would argue you need to learn how to cook. And that's a barrier for a lot of people. Last case study is a lady who came in to me about three weeks ago. This is a 50-year-old lady who's bipolar disorder, so psychiatric problem for 20 years. Uh, she smokes 30 cigarettes a day, drinks alcohol, her weight's 110 kilos, BMI 40. So she's a big girl, lives on her own, not very happy. But she comes back to see me two weeks ago, three weeks ago, for a prescription review. And when I saw her, I said, you look different, have you lost weight? And she says, yes, I've gone vegan. Oh, what's that about? And she said, well... My teenage daughter went vegan. I didn't know what to do, so I joined her. <laughs> and I said, and what happened? And she said, I've lost four stone. Her BMI is now 30. And she's scared. I don't know how much I'm going to lose. <laughs> Everyone tells me to stop. Her uncle has told her, without dairy and meat, you can't have a normal diet. Her friends are saying, you must be nutritionally deficient. And it shocked me to have a woman who unintentionally loses four stone and is scared and unhappy. <laughs> so as her doctor, I first of all wanted to know, is she having an unhealthy vegan diet? Or is she having a whole food plant-based? Which she was. Was she taking her B12? Was she getting sources of omega-3? Possibly vitamin D? And then I was wanting to be her advocate. I wanted to say, you're doing great. Keep this up. 
And interestingly, she, I wanted to know what motivated her change. I'm always interested, why, why do people change? And I wanted to know what documentary she'd seen. She'd no television. She hadn't even seen the documentary. She only got a vegan magazine delivered once a month for her daughter. So her only question for me was, do they really keep the cows pregnant? Oh. And that shocked me that she'd managed to change, but she was on the verge of stopping. She was thinking of going back to meat because she was so scared. And I suppose the, the issue for her is her motivation was extrinsic. She wasn't doing this for her. So she didn't have a strong enough belief to be able to maintain this. But I gave her a copy of How Not to Die and as much support as I could, and I'm amazed at the change of four stone. So it brings up the fourth barrier, which I think was mentioned earlier, in terms of social pressure and fear. If your family aren't eating like you, it's very hard to maintain this, to make different meals for your kids and your partner. If your friends don't eat like you, it causes social isolation, and even social isolation is associated with negative effects on health. If most of our society is based, or most of our celebrations are based around food, and it's often meat or cake, or it's very hard to engage in a diet that removes us from those celebrations. And despite all this, I want us to focus on the positive. This is a phenomenally beneficial diet. It's amazing benefits in terms of health, which we've discussed all day. I would say that we have to lead by personal example. As Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. If you practice this and you're passionate, it's contagious. Your patients will pick that up from you. They respect doctor's opinion. If they share it, they're much more likely to change. This is simple. Nutrition shouldn't be overcomplicated. It shouldn't be all about the micronutrients that you're missing, your magnesium and your iodine, where do you get it from? This is just fruit and vegetables and beans and grains and maybe some nuts and seeds. That's all it is. As long as you get enough calories, you're getting enough. We need to remember to share this. Share it with our patients, share it with our colleagues. Share it with family and friends, because everyone needs to know this. And at the same time, we need to respect that people aren't ready. I might be 100% plant-based, but that doesn't mean that that is the goal for every patient. Whatever they're able to do, and if they're not willing, that's their, that's their position. But we need to support them. We need to support probably each other, but support the patients in terms of maintaining and adopting this. And we can do that by encouraging an environment where we get more options in restaurants, shops. Because all big changes, all paradigm shifts come with major blockages. As Martin Luther King, whose I think 50th anniversary is going to be next week, as he said, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And I've chosen that for the patients. Whatever change they make is positive. But even for this whole plant-based movement, it feels like it's growing, and it's going to keep moving forward, whatever speed that is at. Because I too, like Martin Luther King, I too have a dream that someday we will have an increased awareness of the whole food plant-based diet amongst healthcare professionals. That we will have more medical research to prove the benefit of what we do. That we will change our healthcare, more like the WHO definition of health, so that we fund cooking, that we fund group work, group support. That we have more choices. And that we overall have a healthier population and a more compassionate world. Because this isn't new. We've known about this for millennia. As Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Thank you.